One of the most interesting and most underappreciated trees in the woodlands of eastern North America is sassafras, sassafras albidum, which is commonly and sadly referred to as a junk tree that is perceived to have little use to wildlife and low commercial value. This is a shame because sassafras does have a lot to offer, both to pollinators and wildlife, and as a lumber tree. Sassafras has a large native range and can be found across most of the eastern U.S., but it is absent from Minnesota, much of Wisconsin and Iowa, northern Michigan, and the northern reaches of the New England states. As I alluded to, contrary to popular opinion, sassafras is an excellent tree for wildlife due to the soft mass it produces and is also a host plant for some super cool moth and butterfly caterpillars, and is probably best known for its use as a flavoring. But I am getting ahead of myself. First, let's look at where sassafras grows and how to identify it. Sassafras is a pioneer species, which means it likes to grow in areas with reduced competition. Think of places like fallow fields, areas that have been disturbed with fire, openings in closed canopy forest created by wind and ice storms, or a logging operation. Any place where there are no large trees creating shade. It is often thought of as a smaller, shrub-like tree, but sassafras can get big, up to 30 to 60 feet tall, with a 25 to 40 foot spread, and even larger in some instances, like this massive example. Most sassafras do tend to be on the smaller side, however, especially in diameter, which is one reason it is not considered an economically important lumber species. The lumber from sassafras is high quality, though, and can have some excellent color and grain. It is used for making furniture and boats. And one cool way I've seen sassafras used was in a business that used rough cut sassafras to panel their walls, which was unique and super awesome. Sassafras will send up root suckers to form a thicket, so keep this in mind if you plan to plant one in your yard, or more than one if you want sassafras to produce fruit. More on this in a minute. Sassafras can be grown as a single specimen tree, but you must stay on top of removing the suckers. If a thicket is what you want, then just let it do its thing. You can also grow it in a more shrub-like form if you coppice it. Cut it to the ground or short stump every two to three years. Another thing to be aware of is sassafras is said to be an allopathic species, which means it exudes chemicals from its roots to impede the growth of other plants. I'm not sure which plants it's supposed to be impeding because I haven't seen any problems with the trees, shrubs, and forbs growing around sassafras in the wild. If you have ever seen sassafras impeding the growth of plants, let us know down in the comments. When it comes to soil, sassafras is not picky at all and is adapted to a wide range of well-drained soils, including those that are sandy, heavy in clay, and even rocky. Wet soil is not tolerated. Once established, sassafras is moderately drought tolerant. As can be expected of a pioneer species, sassafras does best in full sun to partial shade. If other trees start to shade sassafras too much, it will grow tall and bend and twist as it searches out the light, resulting in some Dr. Seuss-esque growth forms. Sassafras is known for its uniquely shaped leaves. There are three different shapes, and they can all usually be found on the same tree. There are simple, elliptically shaped leaves and two types of lobed leaves. Those shaped like mittens and trilobed leaves that look like a turkey foot. The leaves are from four to six inches long by two to four inches wide, and the leaf edges are smooth and without teeth. The upper leaf surface is bright green and smooth. The lower surface is a contrasting white. This is where the specific epithet albidum comes from, which means whitish in Latin, and smooth to slightly fuzzy. The leaves are arranged alternately on the twigs. Fall color is spectacular in shades of red, orange, and yellow. The leaves are important to many species of moth and butterfly caterpillars, and sassafras is a known host for caterpillars of the imperial moth, promethea moth, cecropia moth, eo moth, and the super cute spicebush swallowtail caterpillar, along with many caterpillars of species I like to call little brown moths. Not only do caterpillars eat the leaves, but they are also browsed somewhat by deer, and if you are a fan of Cajun cuisine, you have likely eaten them too. That's right, sassafras leaves are dried and made into filet powder, which is used as a thickening agent in gumbo. I am always referring to caterpillars and host plants in these videos, and if you are looking for an easy to use guide to which caterpillars eat which plants, I highly recommend David Wagner's Caterpillars of Eastern North America. This is a book in the Princeton Field Guide series, and it is super easy to use. You can look up host plants by common or scientific name. Same with caterpillars, moths, and butterflies. 
It is easily one of the top five used books in my library, and I know you will love it too. I will put a link to it in the description. This is an affiliate link, which simply means we get a commission if you purchase the book. No extra cost to you. We simply get a small commission from the seller, which helps support the channel. Sassafras bark varies from dark brown to reddish brown and develops deep furrows and somewhat corky ridges with age. The bark on the twigs can be greenish yellow to greenish brown, depending on age, has a smooth texture, and will have conspicuous gray lenticels, those warty looking bumps on twigs and tree trunks. The bark and leaves are loaded with aromatic compounds, which makes this a tree you can use your nose to identify. Scratching the bark or crushing a leaf releases aromatic compounds that have a distinct spicy root beer-like odor with the twigs having a much stronger scent than the leaves. Follow your nose, it always knows. If you know what cereal mascot sang that phrase on the commercials, let us know down in the comments. Bonus points if you know what band made an over the top parody song about that cereal mascot. Love learning about native trees, especially those with great smelling bark? Then pretend that like button is some sassafras bark and scratch and sniff that like button. The bark on the roots, yes, roots have bark too, was harvested, cleaned, and used to make a tea and as a flavoring, most famously in root beer. We don't have real sassafras in root beer these days as the FDA banned sassafras oil as a food additive in the 1960s due to its high saffron content. Saffron is one of the main constituents of sassafras oil and has been shown in laboratory studies to be a carcinogen and to cause liver damage. Saffron free parts of the tree like the leaves are still allowed to be used in food products, which is why we can still buy sassafras filet powder. The other drink sassafras is well known for, sassafras tea, was removed from the banned list in the 1990s, even though it contains a significant level of saffron. So drinking it in extreme moderation is probably a good idea, unless it is labeled saffron free. You may also see sassafras trees and roots in the news for a totally unexpected reason. The two Asian species that share a genus with our native sassafras tree are being used as a source of saffron to make a precursor chemical in the synthesis of the illegal drug MDMA. Sassafras blooms in April through May, depending on location, before the leaves emerge, so the flowers are quite conspicuous. The individual flowers are small, star-shaped, yellow-green, and appear in small, rounded clusters at the end of the twigs. The abundant flowers of sassafras are visited by smaller native bees like halictid and adrenid bees and many species of flower flies and other flies that gather nectar and pollen from them. Although not the pollinator powerhouse some of our native spring blooming trees can be, like those in the genus Prunus for example, sassafras is still an important resource for a huge number of species. Sassafras is a dioecious species, meaning there are male and female trees, which is why I mentioned earlier that you'll need to plant more than one if you want to be assured of fruit production. It is a fairly fast maturing tree and most are producing fruit by 10 years of age. The fruit of the sassafras is a very distinctive droop. The best way to describe it is a half inch long blue black egg sitting on top of a bright red golf tee. The fruits will start to display in June and July, but will not be fully ripe until around September when they will be eagerly sought out by a wide variety of songbirds, northern bobwhite, and wild turkeys. They are also eaten by small mammals and even white-tailed deer and black bears feed on them. After the fruits are eaten by birds and critters, the bright red stalks often remain on the tree. Another way sassafras helps to support birds and wildlife occurs after it dies. Sassafras has relatively soft sapwood, at least when compared to other hardwoods. It is still a dense wood that woodpeckers are fond of hammering cavities into. These cavities are then used by the woodpeckers to nest in, and once abandoned by the woodpeckers, other cavity nesting species like chickadees, the beautiful bluebird, and great crested flycatchers will nest in them. Small mammals like flying squirrels and some bat species, reptiles like fence lizards, and amphibians like the gray tree frog may also take refuge in the cavities. Sassafras belongs to the Lauraceae, the laurel family, and has some relatives in the eastern U.S. you may be familiar with. The northern spice bush, Lindera benzoin, and the red bay, Persea borbonia, are two that many of you have probably heard of. It is even related to the avocado, which is also in the Lauraceae. Unfortunately, there is a new threat to the laurel family in North America. A beetle spread fungus is causing a disease in trees and shrubs in the Lauraceae called laurel wilt disease. This fungus kills the infected trees and shrubs, and at this point, nothing has been found to stop it. 
So be aware and keep an eye out for species in the Loraceae that have green wilting leaves that turn olive gray to reddish brown and report any sightings to your local county extension office. If you want a tree that can be trained to grow in a variety of forms, has great fall color, brings in the birds, and feeds a bunch of cool caterpillars, then I encourage you to give sassafras some serious thought. There is another native tree that is great for wildlife and pollinators that sometimes gets confused with sassafras because it also has leaves in three different shapes, and that tree is the awesome red mulberry, Morris rubra which you can learn all about in this video, and be sure to take some time and enjoy nature in your backyard.